All right, here we go again. Last time we finished up with the idea of relativism, we looked at the difference between descriptive and normative. Descriptive is what people do. Normative is what people ought to do. And there's a world of difference between what people do do and what people ought to do. Um, we're going to now look at a normative ethical principle, which sometimes gets a bad reputation, and that's called egoism. Egoism is the idea is that you ought to do what is in your best interest. Now, you want to distinguish an egoist from a narcissist. A narcissist is somebody who drives you crazy because all they talk about is themselves. They're the people who always have issues, and it's all about me. And, oh, my God, I think I'm sick. I have a problem. That's not an egoist. That's a self-centered prig who's a pain in the neck and you don't want to spend time with. Now, on the other hand, an egoist is somebody who is a reasonable person who says, what's in my best interest is what I will do. It's called enlightened self-interest. And an egoist is different than an egotist. An egotist is somebody who says, look how great I am. I can kick your rear end. I'm smarter than you. I'm better than you. Also not an egoist. That's a fool. So an egoist is somebody who makes decisions based on what's going to help them in the long run. So a person who is an enlightened egoist will say, should I lie? Well, generally, the answer would be no, because if you lie and you get caught, that hurts you. Should I work hard? Well, of course I should, because hard workers do better. Should I cheat and steal and rob? Certainly not, because in the long run, these things will harm you. So the egoist is a person who's really thinking, what's going to help me? Does an egoist help their family? Of course they do. Does an egoist help their community? Yes, indeed, because that's what makes people like them. It gives them advantages. So the egoist would be an upstanding member of society. There's nothing wrong with egoism. The problem with egoism is, can an egoist ever really love anyone more than themselves? And there's a lot of conflicts with this. In fact, I was in touch with somebody who's an editor for Ayn Rand, one of the greatest egoists, and their attitude is that, well, in fact, it's impossible to love anything more than yourself because that is the only thing you ought to love. And if you think you love somebody more than yourself, you're really deluded. I think they're wrong. I think, in fact, people really can love more and other than themselves, and it's not because it's in their interest. Um, so egoism, I think, would be a much better world than the world we live in now, which is generally narcissism and relativism, but it's still probably not the best possible normative ethical principle. Though I would urge you to be egoistic. In other words, read the book and do your homework or I'll fail you, I promise. So there's egoism. Next is an idea called natural law. And natural law is the old-fashioned one. Natural law is the idea that everything that's right is right because it helps people fulfill their natural function. And everything has a natural function. So, for example, what's the right thing to happen to an acorn? Well, it will fall from the mighty oak, and you in Penn Highlands know that. In Pittsburgh, they have no idea what kind of tree an acorn grows into. I am not kidding. They say acorn trees here. Oh, my God. Um, so the acorn falls off the mighty oak, hits the ground, and if it fulfills its natural potential, actualizes its potentiality, it will grow into another mighty oak. If a squirrel comes along, a virtuous squirrel, which means a squirrel that's a good squirrel, a natural squirrel, sees that acorn, it will eat the acorn. That is bad for the acorn, but it is good for the squirrel, and all makes sense in the natural order of things. If a dog, not a bad dog like people have, those are broken dogs, those are dogs who lost their genitals, we call those dogs good dogs, but they're really bad. Um, a good dog, a dog dog, a dog that does things that dogs do, like bite their enemies and have lots of puppy dogs. If one of those dogs sees that squirrel and it's a virtuous dog, well, of course, it will eat that squirrel. And that squirrel will not have very much future, but its future will be now in the dog. So what is bad for the squirrel in this case is good for the dog. Now, if a human being finds a dog and wants to turn it into a human dog, in other words, what we call a good dog, but is really bad for the dog, we take that dog and we turn it into a fluffy poodle and castrate it. And then we say, this is a good dog. How nice this dog is. But that is not good for the dog. That is good for the person who has transformed that dog into a pet. Now, if a lion comes into your room while you're listening to this ridiculous video and sees you and it eats you, it's not good for you, but it is good for the lion, and that is a good lion, and all is good and decent in the world of natural law. So natural law is the idea that everything ought to fulfill its natural function. If you go on the outside now and just crush an acorn out of malice, that is bad. Because that acorn now doesn't get to actualize its potential, it's simply crushed. So that's natural law. Now, there are some problems with natural law. Some of them are, for example, who decides what's natural. Look on any soda bottle, and you'll discover there'll be this word, natural ingredients. What the heck is natural in a soda bottle? This I do not know. But people who are 
officials of some sort can determine this is natural, this is not natural. And uh, that winds up, oh, one last thing. Think about all of the antagonism against certain kinds of behaviors. Well, that's unnatural. These are against nature. This is, when you hear that kind of thinking, that's always the idea that this is an unnatural thing and therefore immoral from the perspective of natural law. All right, see you in a minute.